louder than that. <laughs> Call the meeting to order. The first uh, business that we have is to um, pro uh, approve our minutes. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Hickey. I'll second. And second, second. by Mr. Joyner. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And motion passes. Next is um, moving on. Wait, did I do an agenda or minutes? I already messed up. The minutes. I did the minutes. So we need to approve the agenda first. Do I have a motion for the agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. Mr. Joyner, motion for the agenda. And a second for that one? Second. Second by Ms. Bishop. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And all, any opposed? And that one passed. So I did that out of order, but I got both done. And tonight on the agenda, we have new business for consideration of legislative case RZ21, Forestville Road, a rezoning filed by Carolina Land Design, PLLC, to rezone 7.7 .7 acres located at 1109 and 1129 Forestville Road, being Tax County Pins 17496-72831 and 17496-70589 from Wake County Residential 30, R30 to Residential Mixed Use Conditional District, R, um, RMX CD. We get staff report, Mr. Reedy. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Board, Patrick Reedy with the Planning Department. Uh, tonight we have RZ-21-11 for Forestville Road Townhomes. Uh, the applicant is Carolina De Land Design and the developer and the owner is Optimal Equity Group LLC. It's located at 1109 and 1129 Forestville Road and is approximately 7.7 .7 acres. The zoning is Wake County's Residential 30 or R30 and just to kind of give you a little brief background we have a few locations around town where we have these kind of donut holes in our jurisdiction that Wake County still has. Um, we've seen a few of these rezonings over the past few years, so this is one of those that um, just never made it into our jurisdiction, but because it's being proposed for development and has utilities available, it would go into our jurisdiction. So they're proposing to do residential mixed-use conditional district. Uh, there is one single-family dwelling there now. They're proposing, uh, actually, let's just say 63 uh, townhomes. And as I said earlier, this property is located in our short range urban service area and not currently within our corporate limits or ETJ, um, but they have filed an annex annexation petition that is um, being considered concurrently with this. So the requested action is first to act on the plan consistency statement and second to rezone 7.7 .7 acres of the town of Wake Forest zoning map from Wake County's R30 to residential mixed use conditional district. Here you can see the aerial map. To the north, we have uh, the shopping center as well as some open space for Bridgeport. To the east, we have Bridgeport lots as well as to the south and as well as some open space for Bridgeport. And to the west, we have Heritage High School as well as Forestville Road. You can see also to the east is a stub road, which is uh, Rimnick Avenue. And then you can see the uh, adjacent zoning categories. To the north, we have neighborhood business. To the uh, also to the north and the east, we have RMX Conditional District, to the south, GR5 Conditional District, and to the west, GR3. So this falls under our old 2009 community plan based on when it was applied for. Uh, the current community plan was not adopted at that time. So it uh, is in within the general urban zone of that community plan, as well as within the boundaries of planning area number 39. Here you can see the existing conditions of the site. So on the left is Forestville Road. There is a pond that is uh, about half of the acreage of the site, as well as an existing pond on the north side that uh, is mostly on the commercial side, as well as the uh, Bridgeport open space, but there's a small amount that encroaches onto this property. Here's the location of that existing single family home. And then you have Remnick Avenue that steps to the east of this property. Here's the proposed subdivision plan. So you've got uh, Forceville Road with one connection point there that actually uh, to match our CTP is one lane of road widening. So um, it would tie in with where Bridgeport had to do their widening and then as well as to the widening to the north. So you'd have that continuous travel lane now 
all the way up to Rogers Branch Road stoplight. Um, and then you have the continuation of Remnick Avenue through here. So, um, you know, there's some pavement narrowing along this section to uh, try to prevent any, any speeding cut through traffic compared to our normal road section, which is fairly common when we have uh, connection points between neighborhoods, as well as a um, kind of a uh, jog in the road so that you don't have, you know, just a straight shot right out to Forestville Road. So you can see um, you've got kind of units wrapping around the sides. These units here actually front on Forestville Road and then the garages would be off of this new street and then um, these interior units and then you have uh, open space which is proposed to be satisfied for the active um, requirement with a playground. And then you've got the stormwater management uh, control device on the south end of the site. So as I said, this is proposed for 63 townhome lots uh, for open space, 5% is required. They're proposing to provide 14%. For park space, 2% is required. They're proposing 2.5%. And for active recreation, which is 25% of the park space uh, provided, they are actually providing 68.4% of that park space to be active. For parking, 110 vehicle spaces and seven bicycle spaces are required. They're providing 128 vehicle spaces, and that's mostly through uh, garages and driveways, and then providing seven bicycle spaces as well. And then again, for the Forestville Road improvements, we have uh, 16 feet of right-of-way dedication, including uh, the 12-foot travel lane, curb and gutter, 10-foot uh, multi-use path, and then the extension of Rimnick Avenue's road stub. Uh, this lot, or this property project, because it's less than 100 lots, did not does not require TIA per our UDO. Here's the grading plan, and if we need to refer back to that, as well as the utility plan. And we've got the landscape plan, so you've got a buffer along the north side, the east side, and the south side. And um, they're proposing to provide a fence within most of that buffer area, as well as um, some wider than normal buffers than um, what the UDO currently requires. And those are in as rezoning conditions. And then you have a street yard buffer between the multi-use path and the front of the um, lots on Forestville and on the south side of the new road. And they've made a request to um, reduce that width from 20 feet down to 16 feet. Uh, again, a uh, couple, two modifications they're proposing through their rezoning conditions are some slightly altered um, setbacks for the RMX district. So it moves it from 18 feet max to 10 feet max, um, as well as sets a range from five feet minimum to 10 feet maximum on secondary street sides. Uh, the side setbacks remains at zero feet, and then the rear setback is a range of five to 20 feet max. And then the other modification is that type B buffer yard along Forest Hill Road going from 20 feet to 16 feet. It would still be the same amount of plant units that's required, it's just the reduction in the four linear feet. So we have uh, about 18 or 19 conditions that are being proposed by the applicant. The first is that units one through 15 be permitted to front on that common open space, which is that street yard buffer. The second is that all elevations of units visible to public right of way shall have trim around the windows. Third is a menu of options for townhomes that are visible from the public right of way containing at least three of the following between bay window, recessed window, decorative window, decorative shake, or porch or stoop. Eaves front and rear shall project at least 12 inches from the wall of the structure. Side eaves shall be a minimum of four inches. Ease will be allowed to encroach setbacks as allowed in the UDO. Fifth is that a varied color palette of three color families would be provided. Sixth is that poured concrete foundations, mono slabs, concrete block foundations, or smooth face uh, CMU foundations shall be covered by either decks or stoops or clad in face, brick, stone, or some other masonry, limiting those materials um, from being visible from the public right away. Seventh is that roof lines uh, to match the architectural building style and that they can't be one single mass, must be broken up both horizontally and vertically, and that the maximum number of continuous units without a building, without a break is two, and that the roof line pitches would be between 612 and 1212. And eight is that if they provide front stoops or porches, that they'd be a minimum of four feet in depth. Ninth is that the site master plan is a condition of the rezoning. Tenth is that the front of all units shall provide a minimum of 15% glazing and the rear of lots one through 15 also provide a minimum of 15% glazing since they face 
a public road. 11th is that raised foundations uh, be at least 18 inches for privacy from the sidewalk into the homes. 12th is that each townhome group shall implement varied front elevation styles that provide different horizontal and vertical features so that no two townhomes are identical within the same block. Um, no townhomes shall be the same that are adjacent to each other. Examples include different front, front, front porch styles, varied dormers, varied window placement, et cetera. 13 is that the active open space would be satisfied by a playground. 14 is the type A option three buffer shall be provided along the eastern and southern property lines. And a type B option two buffer shall be provided along that northern property lines. And that those buffers would be installed fire, final to the final building plat being recorded, uh, fi fi final plat being recorded. So those would be installed before they could build any of the townhomes. Uh, 15th is those uh, setbacks, changes that we talked about earlier. 16th is related to the existing pond that's on site. Uh, we had a similar situation with another development previously where um, we had them siphon off the pond as much as practical so that you didn't have a pump running for days on end to, to disturb the neighbors. So the same condition would, would apply here that they would do siphoning until the very bottom where you know the, the gravity of the siphoning wouldn't work any longer and then they pump out that last little remaining amount. 17th is that all fences within landscape buffer shall be wood composite or similar material and be either brown, tan, gray, or black. And the last condition is that street yard buffer being uh, shrunk from 20 feet to eight to 16 feet. And the, uh, just noting that sidewalks or stairs leading from the front doors of those lots uh, would be allowed to encroach within that street yard buffer, which is normal practice. So. Uh, staff recommends the approval of the proposed conditional rezoning and finds it be consistent with the community plan in the public interest for the following reasons. First, the proposed zoning district is consistent with the general urban zone of the 2009 community plan. Second, the proposed rezoning supports community plan policies related to strong street connectivity, connections to other neighborhoods and shopping and pedestrian infrastructure. Third, the proposed rezoning supports community plan policies related to open space and compatibility with surrounding areas by providing enhanced buffering. And fourth, the proposed rezoning supports community plan policies related to community character by providing architectural design commitments. Um, that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. We also tonight have with us our uh, assistant engineering director, Monica Sarna, who can answer any questions that are maybe related to the engineering or environmental features. Um, and then we have the applicant, Robert Shar and Will Hewler here uh, as well. Just before you get started, our timing timer system's not working properly. So I, the clock's running, but it's not displaying up on our thing. So I'll just raise my hand when you have about a minute left out of your 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes. Okay. I don't think it'll go past that. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. Members, my name is Robert Shar. I am the developer proposing the subdivision plan. Um, I am a homeowner in Wake Forest. I live in Heritage. Uh, I actually own the building adjacent to this lot. Uh, we're a 15,000 square foot retail building. And the purpose of me buying the land originally was to try and avoid a massive impact on that site as well as traffic similar to what we see in the apartment complex around the corner. My goal with this site is to uh, develop a site that is conducive to the master plan here in Wake Forest. But when we looked at everything from retail plans to multifamily and everything else that comes along with highest and best use, 63 townhomes will have the least amount of impact on both vehicle driving in and out of the community. I think the most recent stat is 78% of people today work from the house. So when I looked at this and identified what was the least amount of impact with all the things going on in the community, the fact that we need affordable housing, these will do that in my opinion. And the fact that we'll have the least amount of impact on traffic coming in and out of that intersection, uh, I believe this is a, not only a, a great plan for the city, but it allows for people to come in at affordable premium and price point and also still attend the school right across the street. Um, I also had the opportunity to meet with the homeowners directly behind the property. For me, that was extremely important. I understood what they thought of the project. And the biggest pushback, pushback is all relative. The biggest question they had is, will you buffer enough so we 
don't see lights in certain things on the property and we absolutely made adjustments for it. Uh, we want to make sure that the homeowners behind us are happy with the end product. Buffering for us is extremely important. And uh, again, we've had three or four different meetings. Three or four. And uh, I believe the number one consensus was as long as we buffer well enough and that it's consistent with the master plan, uh, the homeowners behind us would be happy with the development and what we're proposing. Uh, one of the other things to keep in mind as well, when I took over the property, I did not realize the dam is on the state registry for something that needs to be removed. I didn't realize it was a top three uh, um, considered hazard. So uh, we've done a lot of research on the pond and how to empty it, including how to get the fish out before we do empty it. So we're trying to be as responsible as we can. When we empty the pond, we're hoping to move the, excuse me, the fish into one of the local ponds so we don't just empty it. But we believe this is the best, highest and best use to have the least amount of impact and the most amount of support for, for Wake Forest. And that's all I got. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question. You said the buffer is really important to you. Why request a 16 inch buffer from a 20 foot buffer? Uh, Will, there was a reason we did that. I'm gonna have my civil come up. There are some challenges with the site. So I believe the, uh, I'm Will Heiler with Carolina Land Design, civil engineer. Um, so Robert was referring to buffers all around the property, mainly in the residential areas. Um, the site actually sits about 10 feet higher than the surrounding uh, homes to the south, and that poses as a problem with lights shining in their uh, windows and everything. So we're really trying to be conscious of that. Uh, to answer your question, the 16-foot buffer, that's on the street side of Forestville Road. <clears throat> and um, there's already a 10-foot multi-use path along with it. And so it is a pretty big dedication that we're giving already. And so um, in order to not lose too many townhome units, we had to request a four-foot reduction. Other questions? <clears throat> so, Mr. Shar, what's the, when you say affordable housing, what is the proposed square footage of these units and what's the price range, just out of curiosity. 17 to 22, Will? 18 to 22? Yes. We've got, <laughs> you guys take a look at sales price nowadays, they're kind of all over the place. We look at everything from 425 to 485. Uh, and in some cases higher, depending on what the finishes are. But uh, as you guys know, there's a huge demand for affordable housing. And uh, we believe this will really help. <coughs> um, Another question, so, and you mentioned the kids will attend the school across the street. Is that school, has this project been reviewed by Wake County Public Schools and are those, are those residents, children going to go to Heritage or will they have to go to Rollsville? Uh, I have not spoke to the school. Um, and that's a great question in regards to where the kids go. That's up to the parents. I didn't believe they have the opportunity to do either or. I just know Heritage is a high demand school and uh, it's a great location if kids do get into the school. It just makes it easy for the parents, obviously, to get them in and out of school without having to do carpools and all the other things that you have to do, like I do with my seven and a half year old. Will the units along that back where the buffer is, um, will those nine units, those are rear load? Yes. They're rear load? Those are real so, right? Patrick, um, item number, are they real? I think it was uh, okay. condition number, uh, one of the conditions talked about, um, <clears throat> item number 15, I think it was. For the setbacks? Yeah, um, there it is right there. No, that's not it. Go to someone else, let me find it. <laughs> um, I do have a question. Can you explain how emptying the pond, what, what are the process to, for doing that? You said they're trying to, to um, preserve the ecosystem or the fish or, or, or can I you am. so the state called me and said this is an actual dam that's on the watch list for the state of North Carolina as high risk 
And so uh, when they found out I was buying it to empty it, our plan, I've looked at many ways to empty the pond without the noise we talked about initially with the pumps. There, we're planning on actually opening the dam with a backup without using pumps initially because of the way the property slopes. So we're gonna try and do that. Our plan is to drop the pond down to 25, 30%, empty the fish, and once the fish are out, the things that we can empty and put in other lakes, and we'll continue to finish the pond. Uh, the top 30% of the pond will be drained uh, naturally, without pumps and without noises, so we're very uh, conscious of the noise. Uh, the goal, again, I didn't realize when I bought the property, it was a high-risk dam that if it breaks, there could be some serious damage onto Rogers Road and cars driving by. So uh, our goal is to empty that. Obviously, we need approval to do it, but our goal is to empty it with the least amount of noise pollution as possible. Thank you. And this pond's been there for quite a long time. Is that correct? It has. And you said it's a high risk? How long has it been high risk? So I spoke to the state, and when he called me, they were trying to impose fines on the prior landowner who was elderly and they decided to wait till she sold the property. I have no idea, but they, they were extremely excited when I told them I was developing the site and getting rid of the pond. Now, when you do uh, drain the water out, where is all the water going to go? So uh, my understanding is the sewer system directly in front of the property. So it's just all the water is going to go to the sewer system. That's correct. <clears throat> um. When we drain it out, we can drain it to Sanford Creek, which is a natural waterway down to the south. It'll be a slow drain, so it's not going to overwhelm it. And that's, that's what we plan to do if, we, if, we're, if we're able to. And what's your plan for the spring that feeds it now? Um, the spring, well, there's, are you talking about the spring to the north that goes through the property? Mm -hmm. um, what we're planning to do is actually run two different pipes, um, a bypass pipe that will go um, next to Forest Hill Road, not be within the right of way, but right next to it. And then um, it'll just bypass the site and then and then feed that into the into Sanford Creek. It will eventually end up into Sanford Creek, yes. And that's gonna be adequate for that. I mean there's there's a dam there to make the pond, but there's obviously a spring coming in. That would you you plan for the amount of water that comes in there and that'll be proper drainage to the creek. Uh, yes, there will be proper sizing, yes. Um, the facilities, uh, the pipe sizes, if you're referring to that, yeah, we'll size for that. And uh, for the site as well, you know, we're also proposing a stormwater control pond to retain and hold back the water for right. a limited time. On the south part, okay. Could you speak on the pond that's to the north? It looks like it's kind of buttoned up to some of these townhomes on the north side. Yeah. Um, How's that going to affect see. the buffer in that particular area right there? We're going to need to fill in, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to need to fill in part of that pond. Um, I have a note on the greening plan. Fill that, that one in too. And you said you already own that property. That's your property. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But it won't affect none of the, the buffers around that area. Once we fill it in, you have a yeah. 20 foot buffer and you, your, your trees and everything else. Yeah, we'll, we'll still be within code on that. And then um, yeah, there will be a driveway for rear load garages as well. So we have to fill in roughly 20 to 30 feet of that pond up to our property line in okay. order to do it. Could you speak to the like integrity of building something on a, on top of a wet farm, uh, a wet pond land like that? I mean, how is it going to be five or ten years? I think some of these uh, residents I read in some of the um, questions they said that they already have a problem with some of the re uh, retaining walls nearby. They had to redo because it. So. settled or, or broke or whatever the case may be now how, how can you be certain that this is going to be structurally sound for for years to come somebody buying five hundred thousand dollar town home you know what i mean what's going to keep it from you know that water's under there somewhere you said you're going to pipe it up and, and and run it away but you know i just don't i don't see that can yeah. you explain a little bit of that to me well we're gonna have to consult with a soils engineer and we're gonna have to do borings and figure out exactly uh, how many, how, how bad the soil is down there, you know, they, they might have to go down 30 feet or something to see what's going on and eventually we're going to hit good native soil and then they're going to have to take all that dirt out and, and um, we have plenty of soil actually to fill that in because on the, uh, it sits about 10 or 15 feet higher than the surrounding homes to the south so we're going to have to use a lot of that as somewhat of a borrow pit or soil to actually fill in the pond and uh, it would, we, it would have to be inspected and thoroughly, you know, tested along the way for compaction uh, using a soils uh, engineer. Say so if you do all this and, it, and don't pass the test, 
what kind of what kind of options you're going to have moving forward. Well, so you have, have to take it out and redo it <laughs> until it meets compaction. What kind of soil are you going to use? Is there a certain type you're using, dirt or? Uh, yeah, I mean it'll have to be a good soil according to the soils report once it gets done. You know, so it's a lot of unanswered stuff still still out there yeah, right now. I mean, no, no engineer is going to sign off on on something that could uh, fail over time. Yeah, Mr. Joyner, we've done I've done five projects in the Wake Forest, all similar challenges from a water perspective, and our team has never failed on any of it. So yeah. to, to his point, have you filled up ponds and built on top of them? Some of your project? I have in the past, yeah. Yeah. And to your point, we're going to be dealing with silt once we empty the pond, but I believe we've got the right professionals to make sure this doesn't happen. And if something comes up, I can assure you we'll get it corrected. You guys won't let us build it if we don't. And so we want to be responsible in how we go about it, and it's a concern for us. Yeah. That's a big pond. <laughs> Again, I don't know any developer who would take the time to empty the fish out either. Most of them empty it, throw the fish in. Yeah. We want to do it right, take our time, make sure the neighbors are happy, and build a good quality product. Again, I live in Wake Forest. My dad's going to own one of the units when we're done, so we want to do it right. So not, not to be redundant on the pond, the, from what I just heard and understand, from the pond to the north, which is spring-fed, there'll be piping that diverts that, the water from that pond that's spring-fed around the current pond? Is that how it'll work? Uh, I, I'm not sh sure if it's spring-fed. I just believe it's uh, from surrounding areas. It is uh, water naturally collects there. But y yeah, so we will have to collect it with a catch basin of some sort. And then we'll, we'll take a pipe that basically runs through this, the subdivision and eventually um, ends up to the south uh, west of the site, which, which connects to the, an existing pipe down there from the neighboring subdivision. So, I mean, part of it will be surface flow, but it'll just be directly going um, right next to Forestville, you know, all the way down to the next subdivision, if, if uh, you follow what I'm saying. Does yeah. that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think part of it. And the large pond is also a, a stormwater repository also, or no? Um, there is a stormwater pond next to it from whenever Robert developed it. So there is a stormwater repository that goes into that, that uh, cleaner uh, pond. And then that pond that has been there for, I don't know how long. Years. And our there. understanding is it's not spring fed. It's just a catch basin for everything in the area. Yeah. OK. So it's not like there's additional pressure coming into that pond. We just need to manage the flow as it catches water from the communities. Yeah, I guess at first glance, when you look at the project, you've got the pond to the north. You've got the large pond in the middle of the property. And then you've got a much smaller new pond down below it. So without getting into the detail, which you just did, it almost seems as if we've got a lot of water that's flowing from stormwater into a much smaller area. That's not spring fed. So our plan is to have a fishing derby too at some stage to help me remove some of the fish. But uh, <laughs> so we believe we can handle the challenge of water flow. We don't think yeah. that's a problem. So I'm confused. If it's not spring fed, why a dam? If it's a stormwater, that big pond has got to be spring fed. He was talking about. I mean, there's a there's a dam on the property to make the pond, so I would think that there's a spring going through there. My understanding is it was just utilized to catch water and enhance the property that's there. And as a matter of fact, I believe the state has confirmed that with the jurisdictional letter, did they not? That dam is like 20 feet high. The only purpose of it is to capture that water. Right. To capture the stormwater, not stream water. Uh, yeah, stormwater. Stormwater. Okay. Did you find your? I did. Okay. So, Patrick, on the uh, neighborhood meeting minutes, um, their their first question or concern was about the buffer width at the back of the property, and they were the neighbors were requesting not to do rear entry uh, along the home sites that are back of the property for the entire street. The buffer will be much better and cars won't be putting headlights in their living space. The Speaking with you, the city will not budge on this issue. What won't you budge on? So th that goes back to the rear loading of the lots. Mm -hmm. So that's something that um, I think only maybe in two or three instances, and those are limited instances, that since I've been here, that we've supported front-loaded townhomes, and that goes back to having too many conflicts when you have driveways in the front with utilities and curb inlets and things like that, that, um, you know, when you do a rear loaded, it reduces those, um, 
conflicts from being in the front yard with the okay. driveways. Um, so you just physically don't have the space to fit driveways and all those other things in the same. So as a staff, you know, we're very, uh, it's rare for us to support front loaded townhomes. Okay. So that, that goes back to what we were saying is, you know, our feedback was we wouldn't support front loaded townhomes. Gotcha. Um, and we asked about it. It's much less expensive to not do rear loaded, but we were told they would not support yeah. it. So, so as a compromise, he would increase that buffer width. Um, so certainly he could have, um, come forward with a plan that showed front loaded that we wouldn't have supported those front loads and we would have brought that up, but he chose to try to find a solution of increased buffer plus the rear loaded. Okay. Mr. Shar, what, so what type of plants, maybe you said this earlier and I didn't hear it. So what type of plants are going to be planted between the, at the back of the property? Well, right now it's very generic. Um, we didn't actually specify any species yet, but, um, per on um, sheet seven, if I know how to operate this, you can actually see the, the different puff, buffer types and then it'll show either um, evergreen or or we just left it open to canopy tree, which is, you know, whatever the developer desires. I mean, um, you know, during final we can always, we're gonna, of course we're gonna specify it and we'll have to. Will they be like large trees like Leland's or something like that that are, that provide? Specified in the type, the type B or type C. Yeah, so in the UDO regulations, um, we have canopy trees, understory trees, shrub requirements, and I believe 50% of the landscaping has to be evergreen. Um, so at the master plan level, we're just looking that it physically can fit, okay. and then at the construction drawings, if the rezoning was approved, then they're out there specifying, okay, it's now it's a Leland Cypress, or you know, it's an oak tree, or, or what those types are. They still have to meet our approved planning list as far as species go, mm -hmm. um, but at this stage, we don't we don't ask for for species um, specific types, just that that landscaping amount can fit. Um, okay, all right, thank you. What um, so um, another concern was the with no traffic calming devices. What is the intent? Somebody mentioned a traffic circle, which I don't think there's enough room to do anything like that. But what's the in, what was your intent to? keep traffic slow other than 20 mile an hour speed limit signs inside the community mm -hmm. i mean we haven't got that far okay. well you know i thought about it and um, i discussed it with the director of engineering as well um there's without reducing pavement you know there's not really much we can do to try to coerce people i mean i we wanted to try to do some sort of bulb outs or something like that that wasn't accepted because you got to have at least that certain amount of pavement uh, per the minimum standard. So, you know, you can coerce people by putting plants next to it or something to try to slow them down. But there's nothing there's nothing we can really do without um, reducing pavement. But you know, it's always open to discussion if anybody okay. has any ideas. Yeah, and right through kind of this intersection back, it is reduced by a couple feet of pavement, so it narrows down um, a slight amount. So press people in a little bit more to I also think it's a natural. small enough community just an area that the homeowners will be mm -hmm. in my community if someone's speeding above 20 they pull them over and <laughs> they have a quick conversation with them but we are open to to making changes Patrick how far is this property the northern part of this property from the entrance to the high school So you can see there's one entrance here, mm -hmm. um, and then the driveway would be about about here. So I thought it was, I thought the town desired for entrances to align. So because this one is kind of splitting the two properties, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to fit it in there exactly. So when you get those situations, because you also have wood staff here, um, you try to split the difference. Okay. And I know this doesn't fall in the, doesn't meet the criteria for the traffic impact analysis, but um, I, this is going to have a major impact on traffic. What and makes you say that? Well, because we already have a problem with traffic there, <laughs> with traffic on, on uh, Forest Hill Road. So adding 63 homes 
trying to get out in the morning. And I know you said that people work from home and that's great that you said it. We, there's no proof to that. You don't know the people that are going to be moving in yeah, there. But fair. My office sits right, I look outside onto Rogers Road every single day. And so I guess perspective is there is traffic challenges on that road, mainly during seven to nine and three to five. Uh, but I don't see 63 townhomes with a very small percentage of people leaving throughout the day having a major impact on the site. That's part of the reason we did townhomes instead of retail with 250 parking spots or tried to do a multifamily site because we believe this will have the least amount of impact on Forest Hill Road. So that was part of the reason we, we, we looked at townhomes versus other alternatives. And so the, re the reason you are asking for the rezoning is right now it's currently zoned for single family. Is that right? Would that apply to us too? I mean. So we're, we're kind of in this situation where since it's in Wake County's jurisdiction, um, the only thing that they could really do is continue operating that single family under that jurisdiction because they don't provide water and sewer as the county. Um, so they leave that up to the municipalities. There's water and sewer available. So any type of development of the site requires it to be annexed into the town and with that, a rezoning because it now falls into our cl classification. So um, regardless of if it was single family, multifamily, commercial, it would still require a rezoning of some sort because it's moving from Wake County's zoning district our to our zoning district. And to be honest, I don't know how much, you know, forethought into the future Wake County plans when they have these kind of donut holes. You know, I'm not sure if they've looked at it or they said, oh, there's an existing single family, so let's just keep it single family because they know down the road, if it ever redevelops, then it's gonna change regardless. All right. Patrick, on the uh, conditional district rezoning, um, item number eight, regarding the front stoops. Yes. Four foot. There are no ADA requirements for those, for that to be a five foot stoop. No, I don't for, believe so, okay. since it's private residence. All right. Um, if you wanted to, you know, request a five foot in depth, that's, you know, something you could recommend, but. Yeah, I think if we go back to the, the plat map, uh, I mean, my, I've driven, I drive Forestville almost every night, and the traffic is not going to get better. No. <laughs> Along with the reduced buffers around the entirety of the property, especially along those units 1 through 15 with the reduced buffer, I think you're, you're not allowing for any expansion should roads need to be expanded. And I think that's a big, I mean, that doesn't allow for those units to have any kind of uh, traffic mitigation, if you will, from noise control from that street. So I think it, the, the plan, I've been looking at this all day and I've been trying to get behind it. And really, every time I see this come up, I see volume over substance is what I see. I see too many units and not enough buffer, not enough actual stuff. I see traffic coming out of this. I see the residents on the, on the, east, the east side being affected. I see we've just had to put in a new light down at Song Sparrow in order to mitigate the traffic off of Forestville, on Forestville. So I think this is this volume that the, the least amount of impact on this would probably be single family and not necessarily multifamily, not necessarily townhomes. I think an additional outlet onto Forestville also creates more problems than it solves. And I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I do know that Forestville is very highly traveled and uh, I think for this, the, the volume over substance is really going to be a problem for me. Related to that, Patrick, did you say there would be an allowance made for an extra lane in the future? Uh, so they would actually be installing uh, an additional travel lane on their side. So um, you would have basically from Bridgeport's entrance off of Woodstaff all the way up to Rogers Road would be that continuous extra lane now because right now this is, I think, the only gap there. Um, so this 
you know, from our conference of transportation plan, they're widening out their side of the road to the full width. Um, if there was future widening for that other, because right now it calls for a four lane, uh, I think it's median divided. And so um, they would be putting it, they won't be installing half a median, but they would be paying the, the, essentially the cost of the, the half of the median. And then the widening happens on the Heritage High School side of the road for the other half of the road. Um, so from our standpoint of what our CTP calls, calls for, for a four lane road, they're providing the full build out on their side with the lane, the curb and gutter, and the um, multi-use path, and then the rest of the widening would be on the west side, so the high school side. Okay. Another traffic, Robert, for you, because you work in the area, you're very familiar with it. I've been there 80 hours a week right there. <laughs> Do you anticipate that the major vast majority of the traffic coming and going are gonna be through the, the Forestville Road entrance? Or, you know, would it, could it, could a significant amount of traffic, because I know the, the neighborhood was concerned about this, could it end, could it end up coming in on Rogers Branch Road and then to Penfield and then into Remnick? I, I think it all depends on where their ultimate destination is. But I think one of the things that I took into consideration when I designed this plan, most people coming in looking at townhome communities are going to be utilizing the walking trails and doing a lot of walking, not just driving. That's what's great about this location. And again, to the traffic concern, I think this is, this is the right plan for the site for many reasons, but I believe it just depends on where their end result is. If they're going in the Rollsville, they may bang a right out of the property. If they're trying to get into Raleigh, there's a chance they go out. But either way, either exit, because if you go out the back of the property and take a right, you pretty much avoid all the traffic on Forestville past that light. Everything else past that's pretty open. The congestion comes at that light. I sit there and watch it every day. The most amount of traffic I've ever seen there is 15 cars at the red light. And again, I literally sit there and look at it all day long. But I think one of the things that we should take into consideration is the amount of walking that's going to be done from this location, minimizing the traffic from the site's perspective. So Remnick and Penfield could be pretty busy. They could be. They could be. Again, I think there's going to be a lot of walking and a lot of individuals working from home, so the impact, I believe, will be marginal. I really do. I have a question about um, how many of these townhome units will be impacted by retention walls. Um, I think that's an important um, consideration because homeowners um, association dues will be responsible for main t maintenance of retention walls. So I would like you to address that. How many of these 63 units will be impacted by retention walls due to um, the ponds? The majority of townhomes 19 through 25 um, in that area, there is a retention wall that goes up about 12 feet at the worst section. Um, that's on the east side of the stormwater control area. Um, that is the main area where they'd be affected. And then that, that wall will taper down to about you know three or four feet on the uh, west side. So um, other than that, there are no walls except for the northeast corner. And that wall is um, roughly four, uh, five feet high at the worst part. And which that's one? just to hold everything I'm, back and hold I'm the sorry. back. Which one is that? Uh, is the that northeast near side, there's a wall there. Um, it's, it's hard to see, but it's, uh, it's along the, the, the driveway going north-south on the north side. Six-foot six wall. Is that what it is? Um, is that where the nine right. units are? To, oh, yeah, thank you for yeah, the point. Yeah, that's about five feet high just to hold back that buffer. So it's flat there. Okay, so that unit will be, what is that, 38, 39, those units? So those will be impacted by it, okay. Um, so what did you say, about eight units, I guess? Um, see. Out of the 63? Yeah, about eight units will be impacted. Okay. Well, if there's any problems with the retention walls, that is a big consideration for a homeowner's um, to address that, they, they will be responsible for maintenance of those, um, the integrity of those um, retention walls. And that could be 
pretty expensive um, um, situation. So I guess they'll address that with any special assessments or it just depends on whoever runs the homeowners association in that particular um, subdivision. But I know that's a consideration. I just wanted to get that out there. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Patrick, <clears throat> in the community plan consistence grid, there's a bunch of red no's. Is that no that, just help me understand, are those no they're not required or no the developer didn't address address the item? Give me one second, let me try to find it. I had it in here a second ago, let's see. It's page 53 of our, page 53 of the, Okay, so there we go. So it's, uh, it starts, I think the first one start with. Yep, so, you know, yes means that they've met it in our opinion. NA means that it's not really applicable to the site. Um, what we find with, with some of the no's are, you know, it's, we looked at it, we look at these collectively of, you know, I don't know, I've ever seen a project that got all yeses. So, you know, some of the things that we have in here in the community plan, it may be that they never, made its way into the UDO as far as a requirement, or it's just something that, you know, that the developer didn't do. So, um, for instance, uh, consider incorporating medians in neighborhood axial streets. Um, I don't know that a development of this size would, you know, be able to fit in or if it would make sense to have a median within a, the, the main road. Um, so that's kind of a, no, they don't provide it, but it's not, really something that would make sense in this situation. If you had a subdivision with, you know, a couple hundred lots and really what that's talking about is your main entrance is kind of having that median divided um, look to it. Um, you know, there's on-street parking in compact neighborhoods. Uh, let's just see some of the other few in here. Um, saving large trees, ponds, creeks, other natural features. Um, so let's look at these right in here. Yep, some like of the water conservation. Right, so like drought tolerance, tolerant grasses, what would you, what would the standard be for that neighborhood? Has that been decided yet? Um, so at the time, you know, when they're planning out the um, construction drawings, they could look at, you know, providing drought tolerant grasses on the lawns, um, rainwater, or let's see here, water saving devices, and they, you know, they could do cisterns or rain barrels or different things like that um, you know it's not common that we see those but you know those are some of the ways that some of these could be turned from no to yes and kind of the the two and the um, seven would kind of be similar you know like rain barrels or cisterns or things like that so some of the requirements typically you'll see in construction plans for some of the no's just so you know but that doesn't preclude the inclusion as a condition, mm -hmm. you know, saying that you're going. So they can be met in other ways, not just through actual design on a plan. Okay. Let's just see. Okay. There's, All right. Uh, I got one more before we, um, I want to touch on the, uh, like the open space and the amenities. Um, I see you kind of barely met the open space requirement here. You're going to put a playground. Is that correct? Yeah. And um, some of the residents around already can, uh, express concerns about other people using their amenities. I see that there's a couple streets over there's a pool and everything like that. Have you have you talked with them about using that or what's going to keep your people from trying to use that? They they already said they have problems with different residents coming in there, breaking locks off, jumping fences, trying to get in the pool. You got any? Uh, the unfortunate part with any community that has nice facilities that's going to happen. I have spoken to the community and I said, would you guys like to annex these guys in on the HOA so you can manage expectations? Oh, so you have spoke to them? Absolutely, I have. And initially, the conversation went well. The second and third conversation, they wanted to avoid it because I believe my understanding, and they'll probably talk to it, the amenities built behind us were not big enough to satisfy the community. So they were already concerned with their own amenities, mm -hmm. never mind bringing us into the HOA. But I, I proposed it, and that stands. If the, Community decides they want to bring it in and control what happens in this community. They're able to do that. 
Sorry, Patrick. I, I tried to catch you while you were up there. A couple of easy ones, I think. All right. Get some good Keep exercise. Yeah. Is, is this um, subject to like an impervious surface requirement in here? There's a lot of, you know, it's pretty dense in terms of concrete and roads. Does that um, come into play? Yeah, I'd let Monica answer that um, just because she's more familiar with, with all those requirements. Okay. So we um, restrict impervious surface based on the density. This is considered a high density site and it's limited to 70% impervious surface, which I believe it is less than? 65. Yeah, 65. Um, and then the stormwater control measure that serves the site is designed based on the impervious surface to capture the amount of runoff from the impervious surface. So it's taken into account. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yep. One, one other quick question. Is, is there any street parking at all, or is it just driveway garage? A couple where the gas station is. No, sorry? Um, the 12 foot travel lanes, no street parking will be allowed. Um, only, they can park in their driveway or in their garages. That doesn't mean they won't park on the road, though. <laughs> all right. Any These are one car garages, right? Or will they be two car? One car. Are right. they all the same? Or the I think some of the end units are two cars. Are they? The middle units are not. Okay. I didn't. So we'll have a combination of both. And sorry, what was the planned height? How many stories? Two. Two is what I read. Two story. Two uh, um, maximum building height, 40 feet. done with questions all right then we will move on to um, thank you thank you thank you so much um, we will move on to public comment so um, your chair is making <laughs> um, I will call people in the order that you signed up remember that you have three minutes to address the board and as Courtney said earlier the lights are out so she will raise her hand at the one minute mark Yes. And let you know when you have one minute left before um, your time is up. So thank you so much. Um, and first is Doreen Anderson. Good evening. Happy Valentine's Day. I know we all want to be somewhere other than here, but happy Valentine's Day. So um, I will speak. Patrick, do you know how to get back to the files? I'm speaking for the community um, here at Bridgeport. Okay. So I'd like the 10 minute um, capability, please. Okay. This one? No. No, I should be, I should say Doreen. This one over okay. here. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to thank all the members here tonight because. I'm very appreciative of you concerning our community, the Bridgeport community, besides the plans themselves uh, within the new community. Uh, buffer zone, as you can see from my diagram, is a very big um, issue that I have. I have spoke to both uh, Robert and Will on um, several occasions on this. Um, I've also talked to Patrick Reedy about it and uh, was giving great directions from everybody that I spoke to. I know from conversations on the phone that they are very welcoming to uh, listen to some of these buffer concerns. I was told when I talked to Will about a week ago, he said that Carolyn said that this isn't the definite final plans, so that he wasn't going to redevelop these plans. So I was kind of concerned that they didn't represent what we've talked about on the phone. So I wanted to bring it up in front of the planning board because I kept getting yeses, that's fine, that's fine, that's okay. Um, so basically, I don't know how to do the full screen for you guys um, so that it's not, but I'll start in the far back. There's, um, on the original plans, there's a five foot fence that actually um, is on the neighboring side of, of Bridgeport and the neighbors, they bought property 
uh, Penfield up. So you just see this is the end of Penfield on this diagram, but it goes all the way up. Um, I do have diagrams here that I'll show you that show that, like no fences in the neighborhood. They want to see the wooded area. We paid premium prices for these lots so that we can have the wooded area. So my concern is, is, is 15 feet enough? I'd like to move it to 20 feet. Um, there's different options, I believe, that can be a win-win for the planner, the developer, Robert, and also the neighborhood. So if we could get to like a 20-foot buffer. Um, so Robert has and Will, they have in their, their sheet um, the landscape buffer zone for a 15 foot. And with that, thank you, whoever helped me with that. Um, with that is this diagram. I was hoping for a more natural buffer called undisturbed, if we could have it. Um, if, if we're granted and the diagrams come back, undisturbed, I think, would help with a lot of questions that everybody was asking here, where um, the soil and how do we keep things from, um, the roots are holding a lot of that soil retention. So especially over on Woodstaff here where they have the retention wall, I think it would be detrimental to start playing with that as um, Sheila was bringing up a couple of times. Um, and there's a lot of good trees. So if you go to your uh, disposition sheet, they're removing like a whole bunch of trees. I've walked the property multiple times and um, I don't know if we really need to move, remove all those trees. If I go back to my uh, files, if I can find them again, let me see if I can. Here's some diagrams that I brought up for everybody. So this is the buffer that actually is uh, based for all the residents on Penfield. This is what they're looking at. I do notice that these trees are not, this is a crepe maple. this is a crepe maple. this is a birch. Um, this may be the cedar that's in their diagram that they're keeping. Um, and I think it starts there. So if we add 15, 20 feet buffer here, as you can see, it's pretty dense. Uh, there's a lot of things that don't need to be removed um, from my perspective. If the neighborhood, if the neighboring um, property wants to have a clean landscape, I was thinking we can split a 10 foot undisturbed buffer and a 10 foot landscape buffer if that's available. And the other problem I have is the fence. Uh, we really don't want to see a fence against this. We would like the fence to either be internal in the property line or down the middle if it's a 10-10. Um, the other comment I'd like to make is that I noticed that there was different fence lines being spoken of, different colors. If we could keep it the dark brown or black, that would be great. Uh, tan doesn't really help the neighborhood out at all. The other points that I wanted to speak on tonight um, with the neighbors in, in attendance here is, um, I'm going to look at my notes. There was actually, if I go back to our um, first slide, which I'll try to find, there is a um, there is a buffer here already 20 feet so I'm a little I, I'm not understanding uh, we go from 20 here to 15 I think it's a pretty easy fix the only thing and I wanted to talk to Will a little bit more about it is we could possibly uh, relocate these two units here which would give the opportunity to move this the 20 feet and this the 20 feet that way, if that makes sense to the planning board. Um, and I think it will open up a little more space, open space also for the neighborhood. It'll bring a little more open space here and here. Um, and then
And basically what I was trying to say with a lot of this uh, conversational piece and the buffers and the trees is that everybody is enjoying uh, the natural look of, of what's going on. This is, uh, this is a scan from actually my property to the back. And as you notice in here, there's a lot of buffers missing on the new development. So I am asking that the town of Wake Forest please be conscientious and everybody that's spoken to here, your comments were refreshing to me because your concerns about the neighborhoods really resonated. Um, a lot of people that moved in further down here, they lost their buffers. And I don't know how that's happening uh, throughout the communities. I don't know where the buffers are going, but it's really stripping um, our livelihoods and our properties. And I'm trying to make sure that that doesn't continue to happen. Um, I didn't expect to speak on this part with the ponds a little bit, um, but I think Chris, you hit it on the head a lot, or it might've been Michael um, when you were looking at some of this stuff. There is a pond that Robert owns, that smaller pond that he's gonna fill in. The buffer, when I looked up things, there was the town wrote, Patrick Reedy's notes, where that, that should be a reparation buffer, and that's supposed to be 50 feet. I don't know where that's going. Like, I don't know if anybody's paying attention to what these buffers should be, but according to research that I've been doing is they're very important for the um, well-being of the water supplies and stuff like that. And if we keep not taking that stuff into consideration, we're doing more damage further on. And I think some of you uh, board members were really talking about that really concern. Where's the water going to go? What's going to happen? And I think that we really need to make sure that um, we have a buffer, and I think from the design that Will submitted is he's trying to give his neighborhood a nice buffer, and I think, again, there's a win-win. So um, a lot of the community here does not want to see, oh, I see my neighbors. They don't want to see the trees coming down. They don't want to see um, that take place. Thank you for your time. Appreciate that. You have one minute. That wasn't your time up. I just oh, wanted to make sure. No, I'm good, but okay. thank you. Any questions? Anybody have anything for me? Can you explain what you said about the 50-foot buffers near the small pond? Unfortunately, it is a comment session. It's not a question and answer session. Okay. So I don't mean to throw a procedure um, at you after um, the information you provided, but that's just kind of a reminder to our board that we cannot ask questions of the residents. Um, if there are questions that a resident has, just for procedural reminders, um, we will get their information at the staff level. Uh, the town clerk or the deputy town clerk will reach out um, to reach them and answer those questions. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and next is Kenneth Christie. Ooh, good stand. <laughs> First, we're going to get to my edge. Good evening. Uh, Madam Chair and Board, um, appreciate the fact that I can, um, my name is Kenneth Christie. I live at uh, 1111 Golden Poppy Court in Wake Forest, North Carolina. And uh, it's good to be addressing you on the first meeting of uh, 2023. Um, interesting, your, a lot of your questions. I'm also representing, I had a lot of folks at, uh, in Bridgeport down on the other western, uh, western side, eastern side of the property asked me to speak for them as well. So I, do request about 10 minutes also, please. Um, it's interesting your questions about the pond because that's what I want to talk about. I think you heard a lot of um, uh, descriptors, okay, but you didn't uh, necessarily get the content or the values that are associated with that. And I'd like to build on that a little bit more with you as well um, and bring in some of the um, permits and things that may be needed for this as too. I went to the uh, December 5th, 2021 neighborhood meeting for this. Um, I was asked to come as well, which was uh, which I attended, and uh, I do have serious concerns about. Let me uh, let me do this. Let me get the. Um, I, I do that. Okay. Now what? That doesn't work. Click over. Can you help me with that? I see a. I see your presentation over to the left side. Okay. Thank you. Uh. Okay, yes, that's me. And that's you. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. She's an expert now. Um, I went to the December uh, 5th, 2021 meeting. One of the things that came up uh, and presented at that time was about the pond, and it was a serious set of questions that we asked, and it was followed up with minute, uh, summary meeting minutes that I produced and sent to the town, as well as uh, what uh, the community sent to the town as well. And um, after reviewing the, uh, med the uh, documents from, uh, from the town of Wake Forest and the developer, their interactions and what's publicly available, um, I did not see anything that basically dealt with the disposal and fill of that pond as a consideration. Um, this is, this, um, there was only passing mention, and Patrick just mentioned it on item number 16 for the 20, December 28, 2022 um, Forestville Town, Town Homes Conditions letter that was put out. So basically, they talk about siphoning and pumping. My point is, where is this thing going to bleed to or from? And um, the other significant thing, and you saw some of the pictures that uh, Doreen put up as well, was um, the fact that it's higher. It's about 15, 20 feet higher than the Bridgeport properties that surround it. And that's what I'm trying to show in this diagram up here too. There's also no mention of it in the December 23rd, 22 Town of Wake Forest planning comments letter. And in my past experience, Patrick sort of mentioned it, but to have the pond at this size and to have somebody drain it and then fill it, um, I, is, I, I haven't seen it, but I'm sure others have, and I'd be glad to entertain that. Yes? Um, your three minutes are up, actually. Um, my apologies, I forgot to give you the one minute warning. Well, so the thing is I asked for 10, because I'm here. My apologies. Yes, thank you, appreciate it. I'll move it along then. Um, this picture, this figure here, uh, basically shows the um, property that's contained within RZ21 11. Um, what I did was I tried to, again, I should have used the other one that Patrick had, superimpose the boundaries on this as well. And what's shown here is the commercial, and it's also in there, but it's important to take account of the fact that Bridgeport has, uh, on the south and eastern sides of this, are surrounding this property. And, um, and uh, they're all single family homes. Um, also notice that, um, let's see, on the next figure, let me do this. Okay. Um, this is the this is also contained in their conditions uh, plot uh, for RZ twenty one eleven. Um, the following information is shown on the plot was given was gi not given within the official documentations, and I think it was important that it should have been somehow addressed. Um, I considered the pond to be mostly an oval shape, and the approximate measurements I made were done via Google Measure. Um, in my opinion, this gives a reasonably good representation of the pond's physical characteristics. Absolutes are not there, but I'm sure I'm giving the good content that you need. Um, I approximated the pond to be about 480 feet in length and 280 feet wide. Um, that comes out to about 2.4 acres of land area. Um, I, did, I took some uh, measurements, a number of other measurements, and I gave an average. I think it's about 2.1, 2.2 acres of land. That represents, if you do the math, a 10,503 cubic yards of, of volume. You could, in that case, there's about, I calculated how many gallons are in a cubic yard, and well, I found it, I Googled it, and there's about 2,121,000 gallons of water in that, if you assume a three foot depth, all right, for the areas of what I just produced, I showed you here. So that's about 3.214 Olympic swimming pools worth of water. Um, it also, with that 10,503 cubic yards, represents 876 12 cubic yard truckloads to fill it. So again, there's the SCM that's up on top, the um, uh, storm control monitor up on top. There's a piece of that's going to be carved off and filled in, and there's, there's a number of questions on that too. All right, let me go to three. Um, this plot uh, gives an overview of the proposed layout of the townhomes on there. I estimate that given the pond itself, there's about 65% of the townhomes are going to be built on whatever's there. Um, my question is, has, I've not seen the documentation for any of this. Has a civil engineer actually been brought forward to give a documented statement of fact as to what's going on? I have some hearsay that was given tonight at the meeting but I haven't seen any real facts and figures on this. 
Um, also, the SEM is theirs too. Now, when I'm like, there's a lot of a lot of things on here that we're going to go over. I basically went over the volumetric pieces uh, earlier, and we don't need to go over that. But um, one of the things I'm asking for is my wants are provide documentation. Uh, show me where I heard about the origin and the source of the water. Is stream fed, not stream fed, uh, storm water fed? The point is, what is it? Where is the documentation that says whether it is or isn't? I'd like to see it, and I think you should all see it before you make a judgment. Uh, please provide documentation of the, of the existing contamination and quality level of the existing water in the pond. If it's just standing water, it's contaminated to some point of one point or another. And I don't know about the fish, that may be helping the process. But um, it's in the UDO, I got references in the back. The only thing I can really find in the UDO that covers this is 12.6.H4-8. And also in the community plan, the, um, the uh, healthy, sustainable environment uh, part of the uh, community plan, HSE 4, 5, 7, 11, 13, and 19, I would say did not meet, were not met. Please provide documentation showing the impacts of the existing leaching fields upon the existing water supply, water that's in there. There is a large leach field which has not been used, I assume, in years, has not been maintained properly. What's happening to that? It's right abuts, it abuts the, um, the pond itself. That's going to be taken out. Nobody talked about that. It's going to be taken out. But what's happening to the water that's in there? Um, please provide documentation um, how the existing water will be drained, number four. Um, if it's going down a storm drain, we got little fishes on the storm drain covers that say you shouldn't be doing stuff. What are we throwing down in this thing? If it's going to be siphoned off, where is it actually draining from and going into? We're talking about something that's 10, 15, 20 feet higher than the, than the low-lying properties. So we'd like to know what that looks like, and I think you should see about it as well. And number five, um, the existing pond to be drained. Where is the end points? Where is the beginning points and the end points of this ponding? I would assume that the Clean Water Act comes into play here, Section 404. Um, it would be nice to have copies of the permit that must have been obtained from the Corps of Engineers that allows this pond to be drained. And I haven't seen any of that. Also, the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, uh, Elizabeth Beiser, or any others, has, should be able to respond as well. If, if you've talked to them, then document it and show the folks that what, what's going on here. Um, but I, uh, documentation where the pond will come from and uh, has it been tested for contaminants, okay? That's the big thing. The fill, we heard something about the fill. The fill is critical here. You're going to be building these houses on top of this thing. It can't have things like wood and leaves and things of that nature in there. I'm not an expert here, okay? That's for sure. But the point is it needs to be gone. Thank you. Um, you should provide by, on the film. Um, the stability of those, uh, those uh, housing that you're going to be on there, somebody should have come forward and said that you can definitely do this and it's no problem. Questions were asked about that. Um, the SEM that's up there as well, that's this one. That, that is going to, a piece of that's going to be filled in and it is going to be building on top of it. There's also a retaining wall that's going to go across it that trisects it. What, I mean, what about that? Can you do that kind of a thing? Put that on top of it. And then provide fill for segment of the SEM. What's the impact on the, if you're going to fill it in, that SEM on top, then what is the impacts upon the, the design of it for the original uh, developments for the original retail stores next to it as well? Thank you. And uh, any questions, please let me know. Oh, well, there's no questions, right? I thank you for your help, for your patience and listening to me. Thank you so thank much. You. Next is Heather Lilia. Lilla? Heather Lilla. Okay, I don't know. L I L L A. No, Heather. Margaret Watkins. Uh, Four oh seven Bell Mellon Court. Um, I think Ken pretty much cover everything that I was going to say, but I do want to read one thing from the community plan. <clears throat> it's 2009, right? Um, 
One study by the American Farmland Trust found, for example, that on average, a residential development requires about $1.15 to $1.25 in services for every $1 it pays in taxes. So really, the development, the tax revenue that's generated by the development doesn't pay for itself. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the service impact fees, but this only covers about 40% in this page, 221. That is it, that's all I wanted to say, I appreciate it. Thank you. Next on my list is Kimberly Glenn. Please say your name and address. All right. Good evening, Planning Board members. My name is Kimberly Glenn, and I reside at 129 Woodstaff Avenue, Wake Forest, right at the entrance of the Bridgeport subdivision. My husband, children, and I were actually the very first residents of the Bridgeport subdivision in March of 2019, and we've had the privilege of watching this neighborhood grow all around us. While we have always welcomed new neighbors, I do have concerns about the townhome community being built and the impact on my property. Since we were the only ones here at the time, many people do not know that the retention wall that's in the picture directly, um, uh, sorry, I lost my place, directly behind our homes had to be rebuilt by Beezer, um, a section of it did, due to concerns regarding its structural integrity. Our move-in date was actually delayed because the town did not allow us to occupy the home until the town deemed that it, the wall was now safe. I currently feel secure that the issue has been resolved and we are no longer in danger of it collapsing. However, I do have concerns regarding the impact that the removal of trees with deep root systems on the property proposed for townhome construction will have on the wall. And now after listening to you tonight, I'm a little concerned about the impact of the pond as well, so I'm a little extra scared. Um, if the wall becomes unstable, my question is who will be responsible, what precautions will be taken to ensure the stability of the wall and the foreseen consequences of the construction. It was my understanding from Beezer at the time that replacing the wall would be a very expensive endeavor and it was a difficult fix. At the time, a single crack was enough for an entire section to have to be rebuilt. I can imagine that there is a great amount of potential for cracks and shifts in the wall with this new proposed construction. Um, I appreciate your consideration and your time. I will mention, since I have time, I wasn't going to, but I'm also on the board for Heritage High School PTA, and we were just discussing last night about the school um, we are, we're a cap school, but we're getting trailers and we're adding more people. And there is a big concern at the school about um, the traffic flow and there's accidents in the parking lot and the safety of the kids is a concern. So I heard you mention earlier, had the school been approached or asked, and I would encourage anyone here to reach out to Principal Lyons and have a conversation about any impact that this would have on the school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That is all that I have for people requesting to speak. So public hearing is now closed, right? Okay, public hearing is closed. And we move on to discussion amongst ourselves. Is there anyone who has? Oh, quick question. Do I have the ability to talk about the pond and the trees? If the board has questions, um, they can ask you additional questions about the pond. Um. Well, I would like to hear what the developer has to um, say about the pond, if you have any insights into some information. We have non-jurisdictional uh, approval from the state. I, I thought you guys had copies of that, so we do have approval from the pond perspective. As I mentioned, the state has contacted me more than once. This is a massive concern and hazard for them, so I, I do, they're asking me to empty the pond, so the pressure from their side as well is strong. It, again, this is not jurisdictional. We do have a letter from the state, and I thought you guys had a copy of it. To Mr. Christie's question, happy to get you a copy of that as well, so you guys can see it. 
but we will be doing and taking all the precautions necessary to make sure we drain the pond slowly. It, you know, to Ken's comment, this isn't something you can throw pumps at and go crazy at. That's not what we plan on doing. If it takes us two months to empty it slowly and make sure there's no am impact in the community, that's exactly what we're going to do. I've spoke to the fire department. They came out today. We had a conversation about it probably five different times and making sure when we, when we get started, they're going to be part of it. They're going to be with us. They're going to be watching. They're going to be supporting. So I've had numerous conversations about it. It's a concern for me as it is for our neighbors. And it's, I'm a neighbor as well. My building is right beside it. So uh, we are very cognizant of the, of the hazard and we will do what's right to make sure it's drained slowly and effectively and the right way. That I can assure you. I got one thing to add before we get to our discussion. Um, just to clarify, make sure I'm correct. I thought the only buffer that was going to be reduced was at the front. Is it going to be some 15 foot on the back? I thought it was 20 foot all the way around and uh, I think 16 or whatever it was on the front. Yeah, let me just pull that up real quick. Yeah. Long course, really. I thought it was going to be a 20 foot buffer all the way around. And I thought he even said he was going to do a fence to keep the lights from the cars going into the houses in the back. Yeah. So the only reduction is that along Forestville from 20 to 16. The all the rest is going to be at least 20. The UDO requires um, 10 foot in these areas. So where they're doing 15 and 20 foot is an increase over what the UDO requires. Okay. Um, and I did just real quick want to just point something out. So for the adjacent site, um, the pond that you see is not their stormwater control measure. It's actually this area up here is the stormwater control measure that hmm. outlets into that pond. So, so that's just pretty much another pond, yeah. Correct. Not so a that, stormwater. That is the stormwater control measure. For ah, the I'm glad you pointed that out. Thank you. It's hard to see if you not don't know what you're looking for. So. And that's all I have. Okay. And the point of clarification uh, for the rear buffer. You know, we talked about the fence being at close to the houses and is there a possibility of putting the fence in the middle or in the other side? Uh, was that, did that come up in the neighborhood meeting? Uh, I don't recall if it did. We talked a lot about different things. My goal is to keep as many trees on the side as possible. I'm huge on the tree side of things. So the buffer for me is just as important as it is for the homeowners. We're cognizant of the request. We were going to ask for non rear loaded units on the back so they didn't have to worry about lights, but my understanding is it would have got denied. So that was one way to do it. The other is the buffer. Mature trees, we're not going to put in two feet trees, but we're going to keep as many trees as we can. And then where there's uh, issues, we're going to buffer it accordingly. So my we're going to leave every single tree on the site that we can. We just haven't got to that plan yet, but that is. 100% on the top of our minds. We want the homeowners to be happy. We will spend the capital that's necessary to make sure the buffer is right. And if the, depending on where they want the fence, we'll absolutely work with that uh, inside the, the buffer that we've, we've presented. So we don't have a problem with which side the fence goes on. Okay. And I'm not looking for brown uh, <laughs> fencing. Brown. Uh, uh, and so we're very amicable to working with the neighborhood. Again, I've had three or four different meetings with them and we want to make sure everybody's happy. The end of the day. Is the fence going to go around the north, the south, and the east over here, or is it just the east side? Will? Mainly the south side there. Um, we do need you at the microphones. Okay. Thank you. So, mainly the south and the east side there. Um, it's hard to see. Um, I don't show a buffer on the north side or a, a uh, fence wall on the north side, just the south. It's and a east natural side. buffer. Yeah. Can you point it out with the pointer, if you don't mind, just I'm, to I'm for just clarification? I'm just trying to verify with my drawings as well, but um, I believe I say six foot wall there. That's, there's a note that says six foot wall on the east side, a note there, and 15 foot with a six foot wall. Right on, it's right on the property line though, and I don't see an issue with moving the wall to the other side if the neighbors want that. Who's for, whose fence is that then on the north side? Bridge four? four foot fence. Four foot fence, and I think the note that's cut off on the left side is also said 
four foot fence. Isn't yeah. that Bridgeport? Maybe? What's the question? I'm sorry. I thought Will said that he didn't specify a fence on the north side, but there's. No, I do not have a, a fence specified on the north side, unless I'm mistaken. I think so. Oh, I do have yes, I do have a note there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just checking to see if it goes all the way through. It goes from, yeah, I'm wrong. It does four foot fence all the way through actually. discussion I questions have, I have a question miss Anderson mentioned um, th some of the units impacted that she um, had suggested to the builder between 42 and 41 to open that up for space is that right did you and then near unit 53 can you clarify that um, miss Anderson I'm sorry. that's a comment oh that's can I not talk to her mm -mm. oh okay I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I can't ask you specifically. Other Pardon me. Discussion sorry. points. Can can we talk about any of the questions that were yes. brought up yes. from any of the speakers? Yes. Okay. Well, I know Mr. Christie mentioned that there was no civil engineering pr present. Can the builder? And developer talk about that a little bit you said you did have civil engineering is that cor uh, correct That's yeah it. okay okay all right so all the right research we're gonna do this right we're gonna take our time well he mentioned that you know one of the the community members mr. Kenneth Christie mentioned that there was no civil engineering present he, he was wrong <laughs> you're looking at him and again I, again I'm happy to forward you guys a letter from the state um, I thought you guys had a copy of it. Again, not just a letter from non-jurisdictional, but the state's coming at me saying, I need a plan for when you're removing the pond. That's going away. Uh, they're they're going to come at me and find me sooner than later. But again, happy to get you their contact info. We have done all the right things. We're above the buffer zone the EDO. We will take everything into consideration. The pond will get done properly. I was with, uh, with the captain of Wake Forest Fire Department today talking about it. Uh, and it's on my mind all the time. Last thing I want to do is have a debacle on Rogers on Forest Hill Road. That's not going to happen. Most of the people coming at me are asking me to use pumps and go crazy out of the gates. Our attempt to start on this is to break the top side of the wall with a backhoe and slowly let it drain. We're not using pumps. We're not going to use hose. We are going to have the fire department there, all the proper officials. We will follow protocol and go above and beyond the call of duty to make sure the community, my building, and the school is safe. That's my, the one thing keeping me up at night. I can assure you the pond will get drained properly. <clears throat> so Mr. Shard, did you, did you consider rezoning this for single family homes? I did not. Um, and one of the reasons I didn't is because price per square foot in Lake Forest for single family residences today are not cheap. And we're trying to get an alternative that's affordable. Again, my dad's planning on moving down if we can get through the process. Um, so the, what's one of the main reasons I didn't? Price points on the single family res and heritage are not cheap. And with our plans, we usually do try to put a higher density between a commercial and a single family. So this would be more of an aligned with what our um, community plan is and our town plan is um, between the commercial that has gone in just north of here and the single family um, that is there. This is. The, the right type of development to put in here. I also think that walking feasibility from this site to everything that's going on right there is just going to work really, really well. And I believe we'll see much less traffic concern than uh, some of the board members have, have brought up. It's a good concern I have. But again, I think a lot of families are going to be walking to all the markets, to school. I think the impact will be marginal. discussion uh, yeah just one question regarding the the commercial does have a sidewalk uh, along Forestville is that going to continue through mm -hmm. this first section the whole site 
foot right. foot of the property line. Ten foot Which also foot. is the existing, we're expanding the road, so there will be two lanes on our side until the other side does, okay. to your first concern, Mr. Okay. So yes. And I think you guys mandate anyone developing walking trails. I had to do that on the property right beside it. I think that's a standard DGO requirement, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. So just to follow up on what I was just saying as part of our discussion, um, this is the type of thing that the town likes to put in, the type of development that we like to put in, to have some sort of high density between a low density single family house and a commercial property, which we've put all commercial above that, and then the school across the street. Um, as far as schools go, we don't have a say in the school. Once the housing goes in there, then Wake County looks at the numbers um, and they make those decisions. That's not up to us. Um, so just reminding you of that. Um, they are putting in the side of the road, so hopefully that will help with some of the traffic that's coming through here. Um, they've done some, some um, traffic calming measures with that turn in the street and the wide, the, the narrowing um, going into that neighborhood. Hopefully we'll slow people down. Um, the, short, the streets are all pretty short to keep those speeds down, but going into the neighborhood, um, that should help that's the, the traffic calming measures. I see in the neighborhood um, meeting that they talked about um, putting in speed bumps and, and historically that has shown that that does not help traffic calming. Um, these other measures of windy roads and narrowing roads, they do help. Um, so I, I appreciate the time and effort that you've put into this and thank you for that. Um, I know that we, we look at a pond and we drive by that pond and see a beautiful pond. Um, I, I and, and hate to lose that, mm -hmm. but what you're saying sounds right, that, that the, the state doesn't want it there. It's a danger, and it needs to be taken care of. So this seems to be um, a pretty good option, um, the best option for that, for that site. So thank you for putting the time and effort into and, and listening to the neighborhood um, um, in, into their concerns and, and putting extra efforts into the bufferings and things like that. So others? Patrick, is there room on that north side to put a 20-foot buffer? Or, or does that just mess that, or will, maybe you can answer it. Yeah, I mean, the way it's designed now, there's not. I mean, you've got the, the alley there, so you know it would require the redesign to shift lots in the road um, away from that to get the full 20-foot on the commercial side. Any other discussion? Well, the only comment I would make in listening to everything within this meeting is from a retaining wall standpoint, you know, I agree that there are checks and balances, inspections and so on and so forth that are in place to ensure that that will be sound. And you know, from what I heard, there's a perfect willingness to work with those on the east side with putting the fence inside the middle we have no retaining issue. as much as possible, having a good solid buffer there. So those that seem to be the two main concerns. We're happy to uh, make that happen as well. And again, I every tree we can leave on the site, we're going to leave on the site. My wife will give me a hard time if I don't. So it goes way above uh, and beyond me. But we don't have any problem making that change. <clears throat> Is there any other discussion? Uh, I'll just make my comment. I, I, you know, I'm just not a, <clears throat> my two big things are schools and traffic to which we have no control over. So it's just, that road is congested. It's gonna get worse. There's, you know, and there's nothing we can do about it. And the schools, there's nothing we can do about the schools. That just. But the traffic is going to, I mean, we are putting another lane in through that area. Yeah. I know. That's not gonna. It's. We'll be sitting, we'll be here in, in five years, we'll be hearing people complaining mm -hmm. about how bad the traffic is on Forestville. Yes. Well, we hear about that now, so. All right. Think, uh, along those lines, I think I'm, I'm not a fan of the, the plot. Um, to Patrick's point about having streets try to meet up, um, it does look from the, like from the aerial view there is a road that goes off into that into the bus area of the high school, um, 
adding an additional street coming out to Forestville without a, a complementary street on the other side or even a parking lot, um, I think does present more problems or create more problems than it fixes. So while it, it may work well with this plan, um, I'm not sure it's the optimal plan for this plot. Um, f again, to the volume over substance, again, I, just looking at the plan, I see a bunch of townhomes jammed into a small space, as many as possible, given some of the, you know, I think this is a perfect plot of land for front-loading townhomes rather than the back-loading, based on the discussions that have been going on as well. Uh, the, the town or the UDO is not going to allow for that. Um, however, you've got a majority of street and alleyway all around the property and right into people's backyards, uh, into those, uh, those homes. So, I, you know, given the restrictions that you're put under, I think it's, it's a fairly good plan. At the same time, I'm not a fan of it. So I think from my perspective, um, I, I'm not in favor of this plan, but it is what it is. Mr. Joyner, any comments to no. close us out? I, I'm good. I, I kind of agree with uh, my colleague here. And I, I agree with you. It would be a good plan if, if we really knew it, um, when you take all the water out of the pond, is it going to be safe enough and sound enough to build all this stuff up? But obviously, we still got a lot of unanswered questions right now. You know what I mean? If they say they want to get rid of the pond, get rid of the pond, then maybe come back later on and, and then once we know, hey, it's, it's, this is what it is, the, this, the ground is sound, the ground is good, we can do whatever we want, you know, we, it might be different. But right now, I don't think I can get behind it either, really, if with I could just talk some of the same points that, I mean, that, to that your, you said. To the, this, this is the risk the developer is taking, yeah. and, and I do side with you on that. It, you do have to go through the process. You have to drain the pond. You have to make sure the soil is correct. You have to make sure it, it's solid enough to build on, and that's going to be the, the permits that you get and part of the building process. So it, it is all part of that process that I understand you're taking the risk on. So, um, you know, it ultimately does fall on the developer if all of those homes sink into the, the fill that's put in there. So, uh, you know, I, again, it, you know, I think the, the risk is, again, on the developer. It's got to be done right. It's got to be done well in order for, you know, you to come out with your skin on. So, uh, to your point, Mr. Joyner, we have no choice but to bring suitable soils in. Mm -hmm. So there's no unknowns. Mm -hmm. We have to bring suitable soils in until we can develop on it. And we have all the professionals to do it. You guys are spot checking the process. There is zero question about that. It's a question of how much suitable soils come out of my bank account to bring to the site. So there's no question in and around it getting dug properly. The question is how much does it cost me to develop stuff? So you can rest assured by jurisdictional, your UDOs and everything we do, the suitable soils will get put in place to build. That's, and that's not in question, that's going to happen. It's a question of cost, that's really all it is. So suitable soils come in, maybe it's 50 truckloads, maybe it's three. We don't know what soil sediment is, but that's all part of the development process. But I can assure you, there's no question about whether we're gonna put the proper soils and it gets compacted, tested, retested. You guys look at it, we look at it, the experts look at it. So there is zero question about what we do on the site. It's going to get done properly. We have no choice. I understand Chair. that, but that wasn't my only concern. That was just one of them. The lack of the amenities and the open space and the buffer issues all around it. The uh, the, the headlights going into people's houses on the backside. It's, it's several things that's keeping me from jumping on board with it. That was just one of them. Just a reminder, at this point, it's the board's discussions. If they have a specific question, feel free to answer it. But this, just for procedural chair, you know, there's not a back and forth opportunity at this point. It's simply board comments and clarification if there are any. So we're in our discussion phase now. Yes. We're That's in correct. our discussion phase, yes. Okay. Mr. Allencrest, did you Thank have you. any final comments no to problem. make? No, I made my comments. Ms. Bishop, any final comments to make? I would like to say the retention wall is still a big concern of mine because like 10 years from now, builders, and it's gonna be long gone, but it's gonna be on those homeowners and the homeowners are gonna be responsible in that community for maintenance of that 
retention wall, and it is a big expense. It is a concern. It goes to the homeowners association, and then they have to have special assessments. So it's just something to think about. Just a scenario. Any last comments? Oh, man. Mr. Hickey and Mr. Joyner. And what about the water? You know, I mean, they said they're going to put it down the sewer. I mean, will it handle that? Will it cause any other problems with all this water going down there? You know, well, they mean, have stuff made like the that comment that they're going to control that and, and be careful of the amount of water that's going down and make sure it's properly fed into the stream yeah. and correctly done. So they've, they've addressed that issue. And the good thing is they've got gravity going down that hill mm -hmm. into the creek that's right there. So it's just a matter of how much hose you're going to lay down in order to get it there. <laughs> Move so, it from A to B. So with an end of discussion, could we entertain a motion? And remember that the emotion has to include the conditions, including if we want to, the extra condition of the fence, um, the fence being placed um, per discussion with the neighborhood. Um, all right. Thank you. I'll throw myself out there. Um, I would like to add a couple requirements. I, I don't think that the, the buffers around at least the east side and the south side are uh, enough. I'd like to see those increased. It, however, if I'm not mistaken, they do meet the UDO. Mm -hmm. um, a request to in increase the buffers uh, as a suggestion. Uh, and then also the, the fence color to meet with the, to align with the existing neighborhoods. And we'd want to add the fence being positioned in the middle or the inside, or is that necessary? I, I, I think that would be um, a motion to approve with condition of the fence being discussed with neighborhood as okay. to where the placement goes. It would be, if you're recommending, if your recommendation is, is for approval, it's for the developer to consider adding those as conditions. Uh, they do not have to do that because all conditions are completely voluntary, but you can have that they consider doing it. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So, so with conditions that are already stated, <coughs> and additional conditions of the increased buffer, the fence color, and the fence being placed appropriately in the landscape buffer. Correct. So we need that motion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, without an, another motion uh, for approval, I, I'm, those are, again, the, the big concerns of that. I trust the, that the developer will have the proper permitting and, and things done to fill the pond. Um, if what's stated true about the, the state risk assessment of the dam um, that we don't have any documentation of, we'll take your word for it that that is a, a problem and that does need to be filled. I think the permitting process and, and filling the pond will happen. Uh, and it, again, it does become the risk of the developer in order to get that done. Again, in looking at this plan, it's volume over substance. And the comments that have been made by the board, this is a, a lot of units in a, in a small amount of space with not a lot of amenities within the community, within its plot. Um, Unfortunately, from that standpoint, I will make a motion uh, to deny the application for this plot. Um, in that statement, you would need to add that while it is consistent with the community plan, it is not in the public interest as part of your consistency statement. Agreed. While it is uh, within the UDO, uh, within the requirements of the UDO, I do not believe it is in the uh, best interest of the community and will make a motion to deny the application. For reason. Just to clarify, so we're restating it, that it is inconsistent. You're recommending denial because recommending denial and that is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, or excuse me, consistent with the comprehensive plan, um, but you know, you're recommending dial simply because it's not in the public interest. 
you can do that under state law. So that's your recommending denial. My recommendation is to deny the application. Albeit consistent Albeit with the community consistent plan. consistent with the community plan. Because it's not um, in the public interest. Inconsistent with the public interest. Perfect. Thank you. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor from Mr. Hickey to deny and a second from Mr. Joyner. All in favor of a denial. Aye. 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 Can we please get a raise of hands? A raise of hands for denial. So Ms. Ms. Bishop and Mr. Sidero and Mr. Hickey and Mr. Joyner are voting to deny and opposed to denial would be Mr. Almquist and Ms. Grobels. So that is in favor of denial. Four to two. Four to two. All right. Moving on to our next business, that would be staff comments staff comments well i just wanted to say thank you to everybody that was able to make out uh, make it to the open house for the transit plan to attend and we really did have decent participation on a not so great weather day and a topic that frankly people aren't very riled up about um so to have the volume of attendance that we did it was actually a really good turnout so i just wanted to say to thank you to everybody for attending the next step in the process, in case you're curious, in March, we are going to have a targeted ridership outreach component and survey. So the first round of survey and outreach was townwide. Now we're gonna hone in on ridership specific questions and that will occur in March. Um, other thing too, I was just gonna say, cause I did, um, you know, board member Sidereo reached out to me with some comments and observations. I did forward those on to our consultant. Um, but part of it was is how can we discuss items you know, like the plan or observations of the plan. And there's a couple ways, just as a reminder, y'all can add things to an agenda. So one, we have the planning board comments. You can bring it up at that point and you can talk about it at that point. Um, absolutely appropriate. You can also add a new business item when we adopt an agenda. That's not just for this one particular email, but just to kind of remember procedural in the future that we have that option. Um, to do that when we're, again, you can talk about it during public, com or excuse me, board member comments, or when you make a motion, you can add an item under new business. Um, but those are your options. I don't have any future open house dates to give you at this point. I know there will be some forthcoming related to the UDO. As soon as we know those, we will um, put those out on your calendars or send out an email so you can mark your calendar. Um, as a reminder, we try to have open houses the same week that the consultants here, that tends to be the same week as your special meeting. We try to do them either on a Monday or Wednesday, um, kind of either before or after the elected meeting. It really just depends on certain schedules, availability of rooms and things along those lines. So just to kind of keep that in mind that there are upcoming special work sessions to discuss some plans and items. Um, if you are at all interested as well, we have two RFQs out there for two upcoming um, comprehensive plan projects. So I guess one's a comprehensive plan project, which is our downtown plan to update what is now called the Renaissance plan as a downtown plan. It will also include an update to our parking study, which is really what parking do we need downtown for it to thrive, um, as well as updating or evaluating our current municipal service district. If you do not live downtown or own property downtown, I suspect you have no idea what I'm talking about, but it's an additional ta taxing district that we have that allows for our street scrapes improvements. That's an example of what those funds are used for. So that's part of that RFQ. And the other one is a South Main Street corridor access study, and it's just for the component of South Main between US 1 and 98, or excuse me, in the bypass. Um, it is for that particular section. And when Rogers Road Bridge is built, it's probably gonna create some more volume um, issues on that, and so it's really looking at how best to control access and manage the traffic on there is the purpose of that one as well. Um, any questions about any of those? I, I got, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Is there a timeline on that Rogers Road Bridge? 
I, I believe, I don't know that anybody here is going to know off the top of the head. I can send it. I mean, it has the funding issue has been resolved. I do know they were going through and condemning property. We have seen some of the acquisition uh, and my resulting to that. So my understanding, and I want to say, I don't know that Jennifer knows. I want to say some of the next big steps actually happen this fall. Um, so it is, it is a train that's actually moving, um, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, if you look, because it is related to a trade crossing. Is the condemned um, property I had to dig deep that, for that office one. building? I'm sorry? Is the condemned property that office building that never got built? Um, I don't know if that one has been condemned or not or purchased. So some of it is acquisition. And in most cases, they've acquired most of it. It gets more complicated when you get into condo associations. Certain, it's easier sometimes to obviously acquire through um, condemnation. Yeah. But they are acquiring all the parcels at this point. Some I know they outright purchased and there was no condemnation associated with it. Um, but yes, that location of the uh, elevator shaft or stairwell shaft that you see, the train tracks will be realigned there. And that's probably more associated with the realignment, not so much with the bridge, if that makes sense, because there is going to be a rail realignment out there. Um, yeah, um, making changes, I know we're making changes to the to the UDO, and I think tonight's project is a perfect example of that. Like, um, when you don't have 100 units, they don't have to do a TIA, but that everybody knows that that is a highly trafficked area right there, and I feel like that we should have had one right there on this project. Even though it ain't 100 units, you know what I mean, they didn't technically have to have one. I feel like tonight's project is a perfect example of, you know, maybe designating certain high traffic areas to if we have a project like this to have a TIA performed on, on something like that. Do you think that would be a part of the UDO? I can tell you absolutely we're updating our TAI requirements as part of the UDO. I don't know what they haven't been drafted so I don't know what the changes are and it could be getting more into it's not units based it's peak period based. Um, it could I've never seen it written on certain roads. You're qual you know, you're automatic, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that couldn't happen. Um, but yes, TIA will absolutely be updated as part of that. And I know a lot of we've had a lot of discussion about buffers recently. Um, that's probably something we can think about. You know, what would you, in the back of your minds now ask yourselves what kind of buffers would you like to see um, in questions along those lines? You know, do we want prescribed alternatives and that's it? You know, here's your A, B, C, and D options for a buffer. You can't do anything else, you know, in that location. Um, five is probably a lot, but I know I just gave out A, a through E. But, um, you know, those are things that you can think about, too. And you can always go look at other jurisdictions and see what they're doing. So, so will we have any going to that TIA modification, requirement modification? I mean, will that be something that we have input on, or is that something that the – Town, the planning board reviews and does, and it, it's just something that we. No, you will have input. You're going to see the draft documents of the UDO and have feedback on it. And I anticipate modifications will be made based off y'all's feedback. I mean, we have scoped the project, anticipating that you're not rubber stamping it, that you will provide comments, and that we will have to modify it. Um, it, it's a really important part of the process and why you're involved. And one reason um, for the newer members or newer member here that I have the board attend a lot of the open houses is it's not just what you're hearing here, it's what you're hearing at the open houses in that process and understanding the important relationship between the comprehensive plan, which is the vision, and the UDA, which is your action, if you will, um, and understanding those linkages and how they relate um, so you really can holistically make decisions on what's best and what's consistent with what we're hearing through the community plan, um, transportation plan, and things along those lines. So to Chris's point, like on traffic analysis, it could be it's not required less than 100 units unless yeah. such, such parcel is surrounded by X, Y, Z. Yeah. Again, I've never seen it written, like that, but written that way, but that does not mean you could not I mean, it's probably a better part way to creating, um, you know, and it's, you know, and I think in, in many instances too, you know, and this is not specific to this case, you you know, tr distribution of traffic is going to be discussed. How is it going through a neighborhood? You, a developer can prepare trip generation on a smaller scale, um, without a full blown TIA as well. 
Um, so you can take a look at what percentage of traffic is flowing elsewhere. Um, I mean, yes, anecdotally, we know how people will take a left out of the site, right out of the site. People will modif go to lights, you know, easily to say that, you know, if, let's just say I live in Holding Village, you know, I'm not going to hop on Rogers if I want to go somewhere I can get to internally, you know, or go on the bicep. I can use some internal road networks, you know, if that makes sense. So those are the things that you kind of have to think about, too, that, I mean, there is some pattern to behavior. You know, we go to lights if we're making lefts, you know, in high peak periods. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to cross the road. Well, I'm fairly new to the board. You know, I've only been a year, but how often do you see builders do that voluntarily? I mean, it's an option, but do you see them do that? Some do, because they want to understand the impacts of their projects. So when they're asked, they can answer it. Okay. Um, I, I do. I do have some developers where I know they will go through and see what the distribution is, even if it's not required, because they don't want their project to fail. So to kind of keep that in mind too, is they will take a look and say, okay, it's estimated that X percentage is going to take a left out of here, X percentage is going to take a right out of here. Should I add additional stacking in there? Because there's nothing more than what some people want is a frustrated customer, especially if you're commercial. Because guess what? You're not going to come back. Um, so there are developers who exceed requirements regularly, and I do see it in commercial, and then I see it in residential. Um, but there are several out there that do do that. So would we would we be able to um, change the hours that a TIA has to be done? You know, I forget what it is now, but um, make it six in the morning until seven at night or. 7.30 at night, something that's more representative of? It, it, it's possible. The peak is slightly divine, defined through standard engineering practices, but I have seen TIAs do different peak based off of what their use is. Does that make sense? Um, based on a national average, it, it can be, because I think I've heard. Yeah, and, and trip distribution. questions about the process. I mean, every traffic engineer that we've had in front of us has the same kind of process. They just pull it from a database mm -hmm. that's a national average. That that standard really we're not no going to be able to get away from. Um, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when they put the little strip down in the street and they actually counted the number of cars. Still do it. And it doesn't seem that, that that's done anymore. No, they still do it. They actually go out and do counting. Um, you, you, it's either a strip, it's a couple of different ways. Yeah. Um, so I see strips, there are actually physical people that I'll see out there counting, and they actually have cameras that then record it, and a person will go back and manually count it as well. So it happens a couple of different ways, but that is a current requirement. You have to know what's out there. Yeah. And, and, you know, and understand, too, what I think is often missed with chip generation. It's not just a 3% growth rate. It's compounds. It's 3% per year. Right. Um, so, and that sometimes gets lost in translation too. I, I will say it's hard to see a small project, regardless of what the TIA says, make a difference to, sure. you know, an existing issue. I have seen TIAs for a very large project make significant changes to a traffic pattern. Um, but you know, there's a scale. The larger the development, the more they're required to put in transportation. You know, and I always say frontage, you know, of a project, if you have one acre that has a ton of frontage, it's completely different than a thousand units that has that same little bit of frontage, you know, too. The thousand units are having way more impact than a one acre little tiny development, but their frontage may very well be the same. It's the one driveway in. But it, um, so I those are some weird factors that start getting into it I as well. I think to your example of Holding Village, you know, opening up to 98. That has a direct impact now on Rogers and the elementary school, or the middle school. I mean, that light is now no longer sufficient to take straight traffic that's going straight up Holding Village, or Forestville, or whatever it is, to 98, as well as the, the left and the right turn lanes now. So that intersection is now a death trap at, in the morning and in the afternoon. That intersection has been colossally failing for a really long time. <laughs> Um, you know, and I can, it was not working before Holding Village showed up in this scenario, if we're being honest. But I think now it's a, it's being used as a thoroughfare to get to 98. It's being used as a collector, which it's designed to do. Um, so what it's doing, instead of forcing people to take Heritage Lake or take, 
you know, South Maine, right. they are now taking that. So what you've done is you've taken trips off of South Maine, which hmm. is a problem, which is a good thing if you start to distribute right. it over three roads versus two, but it ha does have other consequences, yes. I mean, the fact that you have a middle school and an elementary school in all of Thales with one entrance, basically, right. I mean, I would say it was a little short-sighted, most likely. Um, you know, if you get, you know, if you get down to it. But you can also look at tiny little lows that can have a significant difference. I mean, if you look across from, you know, Heritage, where they've added the signal in that one little strip of road, and then, you know, removed that left turn that you could take in the McDonald's and extend in the median, it has completely change that portion of that intersection. So you can also have tiny improvements. Some good and some bad. I, I mean, <laughs> I can tell you every single time I've driven through it, it has been much better than all other previous experiences when I'm heading northbound on Forestville. I, I mean, so it doesn't help the fact that there aren't two lanes necessarily heading north in other directions, but it is able to peel some of the traffic off and it is able to now have appropriate stacking, generally speaking, for those wanting to go westbound. So it there is no perfect anything out there, you know, and, and I'll be the first one to say that. And so I don't, regardless of what solution we come up with the TIA, it's still not going to be a perfect as a, you know, yep. it's, it's going to be better, no doubt, but it's still not going to be perfect because we still have the state law framework that we're working under. You know, we do not charge impact fees and we cannot charge impact fees for you know, each new unit or each new square foot, we can't charge an impact fee for transportation, yeah. plain and simple. So we get into the proportional impacts, which is clearly defined under state law too. You know, your frontage, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a little bit of, you know, if you're off site by X percent and your TI identifies you're paying that percentage to that signal, it just takes longer to put it in. Hey, I did have a question for the board, being that it is my first meeting. Um, Good job, by the way. Oh, thank you. And Before we move on to your question, though, do we have any more questions about what I have? And I'm going to turn it back over to board member comments. Okay. Yeah. Just, okay. I'm going to turn it over to board member comments, and then we go. Didn't mean to cut you off. Just we close the meeting. Board member Unless comments. Unless Mikey have any. No, it was well, staff. No, so we're closing staff comments. That was really some of those, were, I think, were left over from my comments and moving on to planning board comments. So planning board comments. My question's after the conclusion of the meeting. Okay. Gotcha. So do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Second. Motion by Joyner, seconded Se by Hickey. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I declare the meeting closed. Now. Great job. Okay. Adjourn.